Live Jazz KC. Um, welcome to another installment of uh, Convo and Bravo. This week we have world class trombonist, composer Robin Eubanks, uh, hosted with our ever faithful Rob Sheps. And I'll turn it over to you guys now. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Herschel. I don't, I don't know what I'm faithful to, but, uh, but I try to be faithful to this music. And uh, Robin Eubanks, trombonist, composer, educator, and to me, one of the cutting edge musicians of the last 35 years on any instrument. Uh, welcome, Robin. How are you, man? How you doing, Rob? What's going on? All right, man. It's good to good to see you. Um, how you uh, how you holding up with the uh, the pandemic limiting all of our activities musically? Um, I'm doing all the other activities. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, practicing, working on stuff, and learning. Um, Logic and Final Cut Pros. I can make my own videos. I have to make my own content now, and so there's a lot of stuff that I've saying I've been saying I wanted to do for a long time. I'm trying to use this time to uh, do that now. And sure. So it's so it's there's plen plenty to do, and I feel like I'm way behind. I'm just not not doing any live gigs. I haven't done the last gig I did was in Philadelphia with my band on March 13th and 14th. I haven't done a, gig, a live gig since then. I've, I've, I've last played really March 18th, so I know right where you're at. But I, I suppose depression or financial worry aside, all one can do is say, well, this is a, an unprecedented time. I got to take advantage of it and go in a left or right direction and be useful, right? Oh, totally. I mean, it would be a, a shame to go through all of this time and not have something to show for it on the other side of it, because hopefully yeah. we'll never have this much time again. Yes, I, I agree. But, you know, I have to say, you're a couple years older than me, but we've both been out here for a while. And chances are this is the longest we've gone without a live gig in our adult lifetimes from March to July. Quite possible. Yeah. Well... Um, Definitely since I moved to New York. Yeah. Well, Robin, I guess you've been you've been busy for a long time. So, uh, you know, I guess in, in a way you can welcome the break. But uh, can we go all the way back? My understanding is that you you started dealing with music or perhaps with the trombone at age eight. Is that right in some way? Yes. I, when I started, uh, started playing trombone. Yeah. And that was your first instrument right from the get go? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I what would you say made you choose the trombone over other instruments? Um, I think it was mostly just uh, curiosity because I couldn't figure it out just by looking at it. 
like all the other instruments, you can see that they're either fingered or struck or bowed or, you know, every, you, can, you can physically see how they're doing it. But on a trombone, you just see an arm moving back and forth. Right. Well, in eight is really early. Even even like in America, where people often start in fifth grade band, sixth grade band. I mean, you, that would have been even before that, right? So, was this at home or somehow in school, real early? It was. It, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. I was in third, fourth, fourth grade. Okay. Some some kids came in to play in the uh, uh, Christmas carols, and. Um, when I uh, one was playing trombone and was playing trumpet, and like I said, with the trombone, I couldn't figure out what was happening by looking at it. So was, I, was, I, was curious, I was just curious how you made music moving your arm back and forth. So I picked <laughs> trombone. I see. I well, it it's I. You know, not to overstate it, but I think it's really good for the world that you did. I'm, I'm glad that you did. Oh, I'm thanks. Well, I'm I'm glad I did. I mean, I I guess it's it's hard to think of an of an alternative now because it's been so right. long, and I'm st I'm still still learning how to play it. That's for sure. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, we'll get into this, but in my opinion, you come from one of the really great kind of royal musical families in jazz and improvised music. There's so many folks that we can talk about. Is there, when you have a bunch of brothers who are fine young musicians also, is there an element of choosing an instrument because the others aren't playing it? Mm, uh, not that I'm, not, not that I can think of. Um, uh, Kevin, Kevin actually started on, on violin. Okay. And uh, then he, he took trumpet lessons for a little while, and then he took guitar. Okay. Or, or might have been it might have been trumpet first. I think it was violin first. Yeah. And um, uh, and then he settled on guitar. But I once I, I, I once I did trombone, I just stayed on trombone. Right. Well, you know, it, it struck me what you just said that Kevin did. Let's say it took just a little bit of peeking around to find his voice, his axe. And it occurred to me, Coltrane had the same situation. He played E flat alto horn and then B flat clarinet before he played any saxophone. So uh, I, if Train had stuck with the E flat alto horn, we'd be a lot poorer for it. You know? <laughs> this, is, this is true. Yeah. For sure. Uh, well, so about that family. So I understand your, your mother was a music teacher or music educator of some kind. Oh, yeah, yeah. She taught in school. Uh, the Philadelphia school system for many, many years. And actually she was Kenny Barron's first piano teacher. No kidding. And Kenny's still with us. He just turned 80 or so, or 78. He's right in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah he had a birthday uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. Right. And uh, he gave me a picture of my mom uh, teaching him. Oh, no kidding. When so he was a kid. He was, he was about... 12 between 12 and 15 somewhere in there wow man and I'm, so, sort of a little kid you, with, with kenny's face <laughs> that's some kind of bragging rights for a piano teacher yeah i taught kenny Barron, you know yeah yeah and, and my mom's brothers uh were very much on the scene ray bryant yes and uh tommy bryant on the bass and they they're both on um the the uh, Eternal Triangle album with, with Dizzy. I, oh, I didn't realize that. Ray and Tommy are on that with Dizzy and the Two Sonnies. Yeah. No okay. kidding. Well, yeah, they're, they're the rhythm section. The, you know, I actually, I mean, a lot of folks, I think a few more people are aware of Ray than Tommy just in general, right. safe to say. But the first time that I, I heard them, your uncles together, was on a record called, uh, I think it was called Lee Morgan and the Philadelphians. And it was, it was Lee on trumpet, Benny Golson on tenor, and uh, Uncle Ray on piano, Tommy on bass, and probably Philly Joe, I'm thinking. Yes, uh, Philadelphia has such a rich heritage of musicians in, this, in the music. And um, 
I mean, and this is still happening. I mean, it's going way back and it's still, still, they're still coming out of Philly. I don't know yeah. what it is about Philly, but well, it's definitely a, a strong, strong lineage, second to her, her, almost, almost any, almost no cities, maybe New Orleans or something. I don't know, but. Well, question about Philly, you know, it occurred to me, it took me a long time to put these pieces together just in my own, uh, you know, studies of music while we're playing. But it seems to me that uh, a really classic version of our Blakey's Jazz Messengers and, and also the Coltrane Quartet and the folks Wayne Shorter played with, there's a lot of Philly up in those bands. Yeah, Art, Art had a whole band from Philly. No, would that have been the band with, with Bobby Timmons and Lee and Benny Golson? And, and Jimmy, Jimmy and Merritt. Right. Yeah. And so I think, Benny, I think Benny put that band together. I think Benny, when I had a breakfast one morning at North Sea Jazz Festival with Benny many years ago. Okay. And he was telling me all the stories about how he helped get help Art get his stuff together with the, with the band. Because Art, I mean, Benny was kind of the business person in the band. Right. <clears throat> and he... Um, he helped Art get get everything together, and he put the band together, and so so that's why he had like the, the Monin record. Yes, this is where everybody uh, everybody's from Philly except for Art, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, was was Lee Morgan not in the band before that, or did Benny actually bring him in to Art's band? Um, I'm not sure. I think Benny might have brought him in. Right. Well, and then you know. I, John Coltrane was born in North Carolina, but I guess for a gentleman like yourself, you might think of John Coltrane as a Philly musician. Is that right? Oh yeah, he definitely spent a lot of his formative musical years in Philly. My my uncle Ray had a picture of um, him because Ray was used to play at the I think it was, a, it was a Blue Note or Blue something, one of those jazz clubs in Philly. Yeah. And, uh, he was like the house pianist, but he used to play with Train a lot. And he showed me a picture of him with Train. And I remember several years ago, uh, we all the Philly musicians took a photo in front of Cousin Mary's house. Oh, Gi Tra Coltrane's Cousin Mary? Yeah, from the, uh, he did this song for her on Giant Steps album. Yes. And she, lived, she lived in Philly. And okay. um, so we all took a picture in front of front of that house. So there's a lot of lot of jazz his and music history. I mean other, you know, the uh <clears throat> American bandstand and all oh, right. Uh, all that stuff is in Philly is in Philly too. You know, this is very strange, man. We've known for weeks that we were gonna do this interview today. Uh, believe it or not, I woke up today and the first music I put on was Chubby Checker, the Dovells, D.D. Sharp. I had a cameo Parkway greatest oh, hit. I was, so sick, I was sick of all the Debussy I listened to the last two days, so I, I decided to switch it up. I didn't even make the connection in my head about Philly and you and that. I'm just, you know, I had to look up the lyrics to Bristol Stomp for the first time in my yeah. life to find out what, what are they saying, you know? Bristol, New Jersey. Right. Oh, is that what that is? <laughs> to the kids from Bristol are sharp as a pistol when they do the Bristol stomp. Yeah, okay. like all that stuff was, was was in Philly, and and even moving forward into the disco when that started, that was that was from Philly. Oh, uh, like which which, which disco artists are you talking about coming out of Philly? Uh, the whole the MFSB. Oh the, right, Tom Bell and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, all that was in, in Philadelphia. All my, my teachers when I was in college, they were they were the the South Soul Orchestra, uh -huh. all that stuff. They were all they were all all of that was in Philly. Gamble and Huff and right. And even later on with the Roots. Were the OJ's from Philly or just Gamble and Huff were? OJ's. I don't know. They, they recorded through in Philly. I know that. Right. So, sure. uh, am I am I allowed to say your age or are you sensitive about that? You don't, don't care. It is All right. Well, is. so so if, if you were born in 1957, that means some of the first music you heard might have been Chubby Checker and Bobby Rydell and some of this stuff on the radio. Uh, probably. Actually, I was born in 1955. Kevin was born in 57. Oh, okay. All right. So, you, are you the oldest brother? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so suffice it to say, you spend your 60s and 70s growing up in Philadelphia. There's an awful lot of 
I mean, the 60s and 70s, you were right around some real hot spots of incredible music, like you're saying, of all kinds, way beyond just jazz. Everything was happening, right? Yeah, but I, I wasn't really listening to the, I wasn't listening to jazz and I didn't start playing jazz until I was 20. No kidding. That's I pretty playing, late. I, I grew up playing funk and rock music. Oh, okay. Well, do you ever have a student? I know you, you're, you know, you're a dedicated educator all over the world, Oberlin to Cyprus and beyond. Do you ever have a student who feels, they say something like, well, gee, Robin, gee, Mr. Eubanks, I feel so bad because I started late. And then you say, well, look, man, I didn't play jazz till I was 20. The, the example I use for people is I read that Bill Harris never touched the trombone until he was 22 years old. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, that's the oldest cat. I, I mean, that's the latest start I've ever heard for somebody who ended up great. Uh, yeah, so it's just, you never know. Yeah. Was, uh, well, but, but the question is, there was there jazz in your family the way there was at the Heath Brothers house? Were you hearing jazz in the house? Uh, from, yeah. Well, my, my father owned a uh, apartment building where we grew up and right above um, excuse me, uh, on the second floor, Ray, Ray's family was. Ah, oh, oh, so you lived in the building with the Bryant. He was, he was living, in, he lived in the, his, well, Ray's family was in, in that building with, with my family. Okay. So I used to hear Ray sometimes, but he, not that because he was traveling a lot, but, sure. but I remember he used to come through and, uh, and, uh, him and Tommy were two thirds of the Papa Joe Jones trio. Okay. So, and, and Papa Joe Jones used to come by our house and I used to see him playing piano. He used to play, play my mom's piano. I don't even think Ray, Ray didn't even have a piano. He, he would come down to play, play my mom's piano. <laughs> and then in that era, a guy like Ray Bryant, between Dizzy and Sonny and all those folks, was probably working so much he almost didn't need the piano at home. Right, right. You you know, you say, well, look, man, I got to play three sets tonight. What, do I, what am I going to do? Shed? Right. So he's traveling all the time and doing gigs all the time. So right. he, if he, I guess, if he needed to practice or play, he, mm -hmm. he just came downstairs to do it. And so it was Papa Joe Jones used to be there, and he used to do like coin tricks with me. I remember. Oh, yeah. I was a real, real little kid. I could barely, huh. barely, uh, I barely remember it, but I do remember that. Beautiful. Well, what is the chronological hierarchy of siblings in your family? You're the oldest, and Kevin is after you. Yeah. And, and then, then Dwayne. Dwayne, is Dwayne, is, Dwayne is a twin brother, Shane. Oh. Okay. But there's a there's a, a like eleven year difference between. Kevin and and Shane and Dwayne. I see. Yeah, I remember meeting Dwayne like over near Nyack or in New Jersey and saying, I didn't even know about you. You're another Eubanks, you know? Yeah. He was first coming up. Yeah, um, there's a lot of us. Well, so so here's another question. Um, I, I actually looked this up myself. I was wondering, I never got it together until today to check. I wanted to see if you were related to Charles Eubanks, the great piano player. And it looks like uh, was he was he an uncle or a cousin? Cousin. cousin. Okay. And for folks who don't know, uh, I know I know this much. I know Charles played with Oliver Lake. I know he played with Archie Shep, and he might even have stepped into Art he Blakey's played, Jazz he Messengers. Played, he played with Dewey Redmond. That's wow. right. He did a lot with Dewey, and so but Charles was born in Detroit, correct? Yeah. And um, and then there's also it was David Eubanks. I remember David, I, and I'm really sorry even now. I remember when David passed away. It was a swimming accident or drowning or yeah, something. Yeah, he drowned in uh, Doug Carnes' pool. Oh, boy. Well, he's not the first jazz bass player to do that. Ernie Farrow, who played with Youssef Latif, drowned in a pool. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, man. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. Well, uh, well, well, we, had a, we had a band called Eubanks for a second. It was just the whole name was just Eubanks? It is just, yeah, we played at Seventh Avenue South, the Brecker Brothers Club. Oh yeah, and um, it was uh, you know, Kevin, me, and David, and Charles, and we had a, we, we and, and we had a, a drummer. I'm like, damn, I haven't said this cat's name in such a long time. I, 
There's a Rudy. Rudy is his name. I forgot Rudy's last name. Gee, I don't know, but but four out of five. That, that, that's that, what is. What would you say is the feeling? I mean, for folks who are not a Eubanks or a Marsalis or a Heath or a Jones, what is it like to be out to be able to play with your family, with your kin, and they play their asses off, and you can really do something with them? Us oh, is fun, you know. But you know, Kevin and I grew up playing in funk bands together, so I was always used to playing with him and. There's another thing about Philly, it was, it was family bands. Uh -huh. Philadelphia is very, somebody has to write a book or do something to kind of study on it. Because uh, like you said, the Heath brothers from Philly, the Brecker brothers. That's from, right. They are from Philly. The Landum, there's the Landum brothers, the Grubbs brothers. and. But you mean like Byron Landum, the drummer? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know he had another brother who played. And, so. um, and uh Jason Faulkner, uh -huh. he's the drummer now, he is, he, his brother plays drums also. Okay. Wow. So there's, there's a lot of, I don't know why, but there's, Philly just got some different stuff happening. <laughs> well, now let me ask you something. So you settled on the trombone early and it's, I find it, it's interesting, even as an eight-year-old, you're a person who needed to solve a puzzle <laughs> and that, that led you to choose this instrument. Puzzle solver. I was a very, very curious kid. And I'm, and I guess I'm still curious about a lot, of, which is why I, I, I do all the electronics and all the stuff that I'm doing. Sure. And I'm still, during the pandemic, trying to learn right. programs that I've, you know, just trying to keep developing and growing. And sure. Well, for trombone fans out there, uh, along the way, who who were influences for you? Who were trombonists that you particularly dug and that you uh, incorporated into your own thing a bit? Um, well, I guess starting out, I guess uh, well, first of all, I was just playing. I was playing rock and funk. You might have, you must have been hip to Fred Wesley when you were doing that. It was the first solo I ever learned was a Fred Wesley solo from a James Brown song called "Let a Man Come In and Do the Popcorn." I guess the popcorn. Oh yeah. Right. Popcorn was a dance. Yeah. And later on, when I met Fred and we became friends, I told him that the first solo I ever learned was one of his. Uh huh. And um, and I did the and and the reason I started I even started learning how to play jazz was uh, <clears throat> because of the funk band that Kevin and I were playing in. We used to give uh, we used to play for a lot of dances and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. And the horn players got a lot of solos, and I sounded awful. You I'm sure? I am positive. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was hideous. So, so some work work needed to be done. Oh yes. So oh. I said, let me find some albums that had some trombones on them. And then I went to the went to the record shop, and I found. I said, I saw a J.J. Johnson album. I said, oh, I've heard of this guy. So let me check him out. And this is an album called The Eminent J.J. Johnson, which I got. Okay. And then I kept looking and there was a, there was a art, it was a jazz messengers record, a double record called Thermo, it had Curtis Fuller on it. Yep. <clears throat> so I got that and there was another album, The Jazz Crusaders, uh, Wayne Henderson was on that. So sure. those, I got those three albums and just started listening. The first one I put on was uh, uh, the J.J. Johnson album. Yeah. <clears throat> and the first cut is a song called Turnpike with uh, Clifford Brown and Jimmy Heath. Oh, man. Right? And J.J. plays a solo. And I said, he sounds pretty good. I see why people, but he's playing like a valve trombone. And Even then the, fluent, I, the fluency of his playing. Yeah, I thought it was a valve trombone right. when I heard it. And yeah. then when I looked at the cover, he had a regular trombone, and I was like, wow. Right. And it scared me so much, I put the album away for a month. No kidding. No, I, what, do you, what do you think about the, the – I mean, I personally, I love the trombone, and I love a lot of these players in the history, but I feel like the instruments sometimes get short shrift in terms of – gigs or solos or more than that listeners awareness you know i oh, think it's, it's i think it's more like when there is a trombone player like yourself or frank rosalino or jj johnson 
then people are excited or they might have trombone in their band, but they might not have done it before. You know, I mean, have you, in your career, have you occasionally had to carve out a place where there was no trombone share? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's happened, you know, trombone always gets distorted. I mean, it's all this trombone jokes and- Right. We, we just, my water. We What's just take it, take it for granted now. It's just yeah. the way it is. So we don't get too, but you know, it's it's and it's still like that. Even though, you know, like even back when I used to play in big bands, there was never a trombone solo in the band, mm -hmm. and so they had to write you write your own charts. That's right. I would write I would write my own big band charts and put a trombone solo in it. That's how I sure. got solos. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and there's a lot, and for some reason, there's a lot of really good. Uh, trombone who's right writers and arrangers you know right just off the top of my head Billy Byers Don Sebesky cats like that Bob Brookmeyer was an incredible Bob writer Meyer, Slide Hampton JJ's a great writer JJ yeah, yeah. that's right Scott, Tom McIntosh yes is a, is a whole lot of them so that 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 for whatever reason you know it like how, how is it? I never met Dewey Redmond. I wish I had, but I play with Cameron Brown a lot, who played with Dewey a lot, probably with your with your cousin. He was in the, he was in the, he was in the band with Charles. And and Cameron told me, you know, when he goes, as Dewey used to say, Shh. <laughs> meaning, you know, like, don't don't give it away. Like we'll take it the way it is. Um, do you? How do you feel about the uh, cliche that we sometimes read that JJ? essentially was the trombone player who translated Bird, Bird and Dizzy to the trombone, who was able to facilitate putting bebop on the trombone first. I think that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah, it's, def it's definitely accurate, yeah. Right, so it's so would you say that in the history of jazz trombone, you know how with, with Jesus, there's BC and AD. To <laughs> me, it seems there's kind of before JJ and after JJ. Would that be, would that hold water for you? It definitely holds water with me. <laughs> yeah. Now, so now, what was happening before JJ that is of any interest to you? Did you like Kid Ori or Jack Teagarden or Teasel or Lawrence Brown or any of these I, folks? I, I, in retrospect, I liked them. I mean, yeah. it was, it, I was I found out about them later mm -hmm. and, and stuff that that uh, JJ uh, got into, you know, and, and people that influenced him. Sure. And, um, you know, the, the, the great trombone players in the Duke's band, for sure. Yes. And so there, there, was, there, was, there was a definitely a long trombone tradition. Yes. And so, uh, but I didn't discover that until much later. I see. Unfortunately. Right. Well, so now I have a question. So basically, I guess you went to, was it called, uh, was it called University of the Arts in Philly? where you went to college? Yeah. And you graduated cum laude, which is Latin for, you know, a lot of praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had good grades. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, so at that point, are you essentially, you know, a typical 22 year old who's graduated with a music degree who says, I gotta go to New York now? Um, partially, there was, people used to come through and play mm -hmm. in, in, the, in Philly a lot. You know, I guess it was part of a circuit, you know, it was close to New York, so you could stop in Philly and play there before you did your gigs in New York, or it was probably a whole thing up and down the East Coast. Yeah. And um, so I used to go hear bands play, and um, I remember I saw uh, Julian Priester play in, in Philly, and I got to talk to him, and he, he said, you know, you should go to New York, and everybody that I spoke to said, go to New York. Yeah. So I, uh, <clears throat> so what happened was uh, uh, Slide Hampton came to Philadelphia to play. Okay. And this was right after um, he did the arrangements for uh, Sophisticated Giants, this Dexter Gordon album. That is, that's the first Dexter record I ever heard. I was like 12 or 13, and that's incredible writing on that record. Yeah, slide. Particularly, slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, Sly did like the, the, all the arrangements for it. Right. I think Woody was on there. Woody, Shaw, and Benny Bailey. But to me, what was really fresh about the arranging was even on Fried Bananas, the way that he extended it with Bobby Hutcherson on Vibes and Frank West yeah. on Food, that really created a new sound in a, a small big band kind of, you know, nonette kind of flavor. No, that's true. I forgot. I forgot Frank was on there. Yeah. So he, um, that album had just come out. And then I heard that he was coming to uh, play at, I think it was called Stars, this club in Philly that mm -hmm. I used to play with a big band. And so I went there and in the audience was Al Gray. Oh yeah. Who was a very good friend of mine, also from Philly. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I was actually in his band for two years. I don't know if you knew that. No. I played an Al's, well, quintet, sextet with his son, Michael. So two bones and tenor uh, around 1991, somewhere in there. I got a couple of years with Al Gray. And it wasn't what I was planning, but I, you, you know this. I learned more about blues and ballads on that gig, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember he used to do some, a lot of stuff with uh, some, some well, Jimmy Forrest, definitely. He used to do it. Al, Al did a bunch of stuff with Jimmy Forrest. And he was sure. doing some stuff some stuff with, uh, I forget this other tenor player that he used to do stuff with, probably maybe right. Ricky, Ricky Woodard or somebody like that, or? Possibly. Or maybe but, Billy, no, Billy no, Mitchell. No, it was, it was like Al Cohn, mm -hmm. something like this, I think it was Al Cohn. But um, yeah, yeah, so so anyway, uh, Al was, was, was actually very instrumental in, in my development because when we were, back in that time in Philly, um, right before, before I, when I was still in high school at Central High School, <clears throat> every every neighborhood had like two or three bands. It was no like kidding. it was like this live live music scene was kicking in Philly, and it was like at least ten bands playing all over the city. We play every week. Wow! Somewhere for dances and proms and. They used to have what they, um, I forget what they used to call them. It'll come to me. But um, <clears throat> we used to play all these dances every every uh, weekend. And, and we worked every weekend when I was like 15. That's the way to do it, isn't it? After, when you're young, play yeah. all the time. I was 15 or 16 and we would play all, of, all, these, all these dances. And we used to play the school proms because the band was popular and to play out in the park and splash parties at pool at okay. public pools and things like that the bands would play at pools <laughs> yeah we used to play at, at the pools <laughs> it was crazy that's but, that's uh, another kind of gig i never it was, heard but it was always you know we were always working and um and um one of the other bands in the germantown area where i was grew up in uh there was a lot of bands in germany there was, there was way more than three in just in germantown and um, one, it was a band. Our band was called uh, Pitch Black. Okay. And then we had a. And then we changed. Then we kind of formed a band. It's called Sundown. And there was another band called Sapphire. And Mike Gray played in Sapphire. Okay. So when when Al would come back home um, from Basie tours, Count Basie tours, he would get all of us together and uh, put charts in front of us and stuff. He said, y'all need to learn how to play standards. And I had, I had no idea what a standard was. Uh -huh. I remember asking him, I said, what, what's, the, what's a standard? He says, you know, songs like Embraceable You and all that. I mean, he started naming all these songs I had never even heard of before. Uh -huh. I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it didn't really, uh, and, and for me, jazz, it was like I used to call it like barbershop music, huh. because, because when we used to go to the barbershop, the barbershop, the cat in the barbershop would have jazz, the jazz station playing. Okay. While they cut our hair, so that's, I because it wasn't music that I listened to at all. Right. And um, so uh, Al was 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 there when I when I met Slide, and he and he's the one that introduced me to Slide at that gig when um, Slide was uh, 
at Stars, where he was um, after he had done the record, the uh, recording with uh, Dexter. Yes, <clears throat> and he and he came back to, to the United States because he was living in Europe for about ten years. He told me he went there for a weekend and stayed ten years. Because he's not was, the only one, right? Because <laughs> it was so nice. He was living in Paris and right all around Europe and everything. They actually had a had a band called the Paris Reunion Band that formed some years later. Oh yeah, and I do remember, I don't remember everybody, but I know Jimmy Woody was on bass and definitely yeah. my man Benny Bailey, one of my favorite yeah. trumpet players was in that band too. Yeah, I, remember, I, used, I met Benny, used to see him a lot. Oh, and yeah. on anyway, on the intermission, uh, uh, Al introduced me to Slide and then Slide asked me if I had my horn. And I said, yeah, so he asked me to sit in on the next set. So I played two songs with him. And at the end of the night, he asked me to join this trombone choir that he had called World, the World of Trombones. Trombones. Yes. In, in, up in New York. And that's you, how I, that's how I started coming to New York. Ah, OK. And uh, uh, I remember vaguely, uh, were Doug Provyance uh, and Janice Robinson in that group, I think? Yeah, Steve Ture. Is that, is that the first time that you met Steve playing in that ensemble? Yeah, Steve Ture, Clifton Anderson, Clarence Banks. It was a lot of Earl oh, McIntyre. Yeah. And, wow. And, and one, man, Clifford Adams. Who was, Cliff Adams. Now, this is Cliff Adams, who some folks are going to know from Thad and Mel, and other folks are going to know from Cool and the Gang, correct? Yes, but he was he was an amazing player. Cliff Adams. <laughs> and is he still with us, or did he pass? No, unfortunately, he, he 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 died some years ago. Right. I really miss him. He was he was he was really really good player, and there was so many people that passed through that band. And later on, Conrad Herwig was in the band. This guy right. named Kenny Crane did some gigs with us. And well, what a, what a way to go to New York. I mean, basically, with Slide as the mentor and band leader, you're not going to get a better arranger in life to play their parts. And obviously, Slide, as that great arranger and that beautiful trombone player, who's going to write for trombones like Slide Hampton? Right. So it was, and, and he he gave me keys to his apartment. Uh huh. So when I came to New York to rehearse with the with the trombone choir, I didn't know anybody knew. I stayed with him, Beautiful. and I used to play. I played, as, and still to this day, that's the most I ever practiced in my life because I was really trying to impress him that I was, how serious I was. So I would practice first thing when I woke up, before I went to, went, went to take a piss in the morning, I would yeah. play some notes. And sure. the last thing before I went to sleep, I would play some notes. I just wanted him to hear me practice. And right. then I would just follow him around all the clubs in New York. We used to go to the Vanguard. I remember this guy Cliff used to be on the door and, um, and I used to just, and I said, I'm with him. So I used to get in all the clubs free just from hanging out with Slide and he's with Sweet Basils. That's when it was uh, Sweet Basils and 7th Avenue South and Vanguard. All that was just on 7th Avenue. And Fat Tuesdays. Fat Tuesdays was on the east side. And, right. And they had Lush Life. And it was the, it was like the heyday of, of, the, of the club. And of course, Bradley's. Well, the question is, coming from this, I mean, that's to me, that's a wonderful stroke of luck to have a, have a mentor like that. I mean, not only to have, even now at this moment in 2020, I bet Slide is still one of your very favorite trombone players. And here's the guy who mentored you and shepherded you and took you around New York. Oh, definitely. I, I owe Slide so much. I mean, I, I could never pay him back for what he's done. For me. I hear you. Well, so really quick question. I remember there were a couple of great vinyl records of World of Trombones. Did that band tour or perform much? We used to tour, but the, 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 the strange thing is that I'd never recorded with the band. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, I played in the band for many, many, many years. And then when I left the band, he kind of put a second version of it together, but I wasn't, I wasn't involved in it. I think I was probably playing with Dave Holland by then. Well, what were the what were the other things that you started doing in New York? So you're living in Slide's apartment, you're playing in World of Trombones, you're going to these clubs and meeting cats and sitting in and everything. Uh, what would be a couple of other early gigs for you with some great players that that developed from moving to New York? 
Uh, well, one of the first things that happened when I moved to New York is I started getting a lot of gigs in Philly. <laughs> ah, so you had to, did you have to take the train or just drive back? Yeah, all take the, time? the train. But you know, once you moved to New York, I said, "Oh, he's in New York." He said, "We should hire him." <laughs> oh gosh. But I used to do a lot of recording sessions. I used to do stuff for affiliate for Gamble and Huff and Philly International Records. Yeah. I used to I played on some of those uh, those disco records that was happening back then with the South Soul Orchestra and MFSB. Because did my, you play on TSOP by MFSB? The Sound of Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, all the all those all those they, they for that whole disco thing was happening or as it was trailing out they would do recordings for, that, that was like the house band for, and they would bring people in. I remember I, I recorded for, with, on a Teddy Pendergrass record and mm -hmm. uh, OJ's record and... So the, the fact of the matter is, if somebody looks back today and they're familiar with your career, Robin, and your own music and your jazz connections, they wouldn't realize that your entire childhood prepared you for playing rock and funk and, and doing this. You were already doing that all the time. Oh yeah, that's that's my my roots. I mean, okay. actually, and, and the other thing is I played on some of the earliest hip hop records, the rap records. No kidding. I was I used to be in the horn section, it's called the Chops Horn section. And we played before uh, Grandmaster Flash and okay. uh, oh, yeah. I, I forget, somebody Furious Five. I forget some of the names. A song, yeah, called, the Eighth, a song called the Eighth Wonder and uh -huh. Apache and, and some song called I forget the name of that song. But but all the, a lot of this early stuff that they used to have on Sugar Hill Records. I was okay. part of the horn section for that. This was late seventies. Okay. Well, so and some of the other you know, kind of big name pop gigs that you did later uh, would, uh, if I mention these three names, tell me if these were more like record dates or like ongoing associations. Uh, the Rolling Stones, Barbara Streisand, and that Talking Heads record that we spoke about. Well, the Rolling Stones, we just did a, a, a recording session. I used to sub for Steve Ture a lot on um, Saturday Night Live because he's been doing that for over 30, 30 years. 30 years longer, yeah. Yeah, so, I used to, so it was about five or six years I was his sub, his main sub. Okay. And I got along really well with Lenny Pickett, so he would get me to um, do some of these horn section things that he was that he did, and uh -huh. we did one for uh, Bob Dylan. Oh, yeah? And, um, and I think we did this, the Talking Heads one was that, and... Um, <clears throat> and then the the chops horn section that I did stuff with for um, Sugar Hill Records and the early and those rap records that was the horn section that we, we for the Rolling Stones. Okay. And we did this song called Sex Drive. I don't remember that one. <laughs> I don't remember it either. But we yeah. played, we played like one or two songs on the record, and and Mick Jagger was in, was the only person from the band. That was in the studio with us when we did we laid down the horns, and so but it was just a um, a, a, a recording. Mike uh, uh, Michael Davis, a really great trombone player, he he started touring with them a lot, right? And um, and the Talking Heads was just a recording session also. I'd and like to mention that real quick, if I could, just for the listeners. The name of the band is, I mean, the, the name of the record is Naked, it's a Talking Heads record with a big chimpanzee portrait on the cover. And the tunes with horns are killing. Uh, I know that record intimately. In fact, believe it or not, it's on cassette in my car right now. <laughs> on an original cassette, not one I made. Uh, no, you I, haven't, know, I, haven't, I haven't heard that in that rec record. In. Man, you gotta hear that record. The, the, and for the listeners, there some of the songs that feature horns on that record, uh, Blind and Mr. Jones and, um, there, there are a couple of others, but Boku Horns, Lenny Pickett and his his uh, partners in crime, I think Stan Harrison and Steve Ellison in the sax section, and all kinds of kind of like Latin cats, cats who played a lot of Latin gigs, like Mitch Froman on saxophone and Steve Glues Band on trumpet. And oh. I know Earl Gardner played lead trumpet on some of these tracks. 
and you were there too. And, and I had asked you uh, before we started the interview, if you played bass trombone, you said not exactly. Yeah, I probably played some bass trombone parts with my trigger because I have this regular horn I use as an F attachment so I can play those right. low, some of the low notes. Well, the question though, Robin is, you know, I, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you've become a real icon of jazz trombone over a long period of time. Have you kind of left the pop and soul and funk gigs behind a couple of decades ago or do they ever still come up? Well, uh, I don't get called as much. I used to the chops, the chops horn section used to call me a lot, but then I started, once I started working with Dave and started touring around a lot sure. more, I wasn't available, but I, I, I hooked up one of my former students from Oberlin named John Aarons. So he's, he's been playing with that horn section now for at least about the last, almost last 10 years or so. I see. Okay. So I haven't been doing that, but, but, you know, but I incorporate more rock and funk stuff in my own music. Well, sure. speaking of which, let me open up a whole can of worms now, Dave Holland. Um, so Dave Holland, I used to go to the Banff Center and, uh, and studied with an amazing faculty that, to put it shortly, included Dave's entire quintet in residence. And this is in the 80s. And that the first quintet that you, I guess, later became a part of was the one with Steve Coleman, Julian Priester, Kenny Wheeler, and Smitty. Marvin Smitty Smith. And that was an unbelievable band with the greatest um, variety of musical personalities, even just in that horn section. Oh my God, with those three cats. And, uh, and by the way, I don't know if you know, Julian Priester turned 85 last week. Wow. Really? He's still here, knock on wood, and he's, he's okay and he's insane. Well, I, know, I remember he had some health problems a while, long time ago now. Yeah, yeah but, but Julian is, you know, He's like Dorian Gray, man. You know, no, you know Julian looked, never, he looked great. No. Julian looked the exact same from like 1950 until about 10 years ago. Um, but I, I found that that band really interesting. It was incredible. But I think that the band changed when I guess Julian left and you came in because the band did record with all the other same cats with Steve and Kenny and Smitty, right? Yeah, I, I just when um, uh. I think me and Steve were roommates then, or, or me and Smitty, I forget, because we were all roommates at one I was roommates with both of them. But when Julian left the band, uh, Steve and Smitty recommended me to Dave. And so I went to a rehearsal, and next thing I knew, we had some gigs. <laughs> Well, Robin, that's because you can play, well, you know, because you can play in nine and 11 and 13, you know what I'm saying? You know, well, you know, I mean, if you can't play in old meter, you know, you can't really play in the Dave Holland quintet. That's a pretty good Dave imitation there. Thanks. Well, I met him when I was 18. I've had a lot of time to practice. I'll tell you a quick story, <laughs> which is I was 18 years old. It was the first time I was at Banff and, you know, I was a wild kid and I, you know, we use our ears. We imitate other cats on our horn and for me verbally also. So I had this imitation of Dave and, you know, Kenny Wheeler was easy to do. <laughs> oh, well, you know, but anyway, Dave, he comes up to me in the cafeteria, man. I've got like, this is like high school. I've got like a cafeteria tray full of food and Dave gets behind me on the line and he goes, uh, Hey, we I said, Oh, hi, Dave. How you doing? He goes, uh, um, so, you know, I heard you got this, uh, this imitation of me. And my heart went into it my knees. Sounds knee. like really good. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. You know, I didn't want to lie, but I was really embarrassed, and I thought Dave was angry. So, I, you know, and he's one of my idols. I mean, at eighteen, I mean, I was all in with jazz like you were. So I knew who Dave was before I went there, and I was so thrilled to be around him and his bass playing and his tunes and his you know philosophy. So he says, um, "Well, I heard you got this imitation of me, Rob." And I said, "Oh, oh no, Dave, no, I don't." He goes, "I heard you do." Because you know how Dave can really get in your face when he is not getting what he wants. He'll keep on getting on you until he gets it, and he'll get it, you know, in his in his it's gentle very, British he's way. Done it very well, by the way. I just I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Oh, good. Well, so he said he says, and I said, no, I don't, Dave. And he goes, I heard it's pretty good. <laughs> and then he, and then Dave Holland made me do my Dave Holland. For him. <coughs> so that's that's Dave. But, but that band, Robin, I was going to say, it wasn't actually the very first time I heard you play, just for me personally. That first time was 
a favorite record of mine called Decode Yourself by Ronald Shannon Jackson. Oh, wow. An incredible record, and it had a very interesting front line. Uh, my friend Eric Person on alto, you on trombone, and a fellow named, I believe, Akbar Ali on violin. So, and the, and the song Thieves Market knocked me out so much that I transcribed it and did it on my senior recital. Wow, I don't, I don't remember any, any of the songs. I remember, I remember Shannon, it was, I really enjoyed, it was different, you know, it was really avant-garde and very free kind of stuff. Vernon Reed was playing. Yeah, and actually our friend who just passed during this horrible pandemic time, Onaje Allen Gums was playing keyboards on that record, was he not? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't remember that Anaji was on there. Yeah, but, uh, I, but they probably was the connection because there's the whole Buddhist connection between Anaji and Ronald and me. Yes, so that may have been how they, that, they, how they connected. Well, I have to tell you, when I heard you play on that record, you had a song. I think on that, I mean, you had a solo on Thieves Market, and I remember thinking, I never hear trombone players play fives and sevens. What is this guy into, man? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like even back then, whenever that would have been, let's say roughly 83, 85, something like that for that record. Yeah, so um, it was shortly after I moved to New York, that's for sure. Yeah, it was, it, it, was, it was clear to me from the little I heard you on that record that you were already into some other things on the trombone. And just so you know, it piqued my interest on that record with Shannon the very first time I heard you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was right around the time when we were, we were, we were still putting the M bass stuff together. I was going to ask you about that, but can you can you uh, put a pin in that for a second so we can play some music that you played with Dave Holland? Oh, uh, sure. I remember the band coming to, I believe, the Aladdin Theater in Portland, Oregon. And it was the band that we're about to see. Um, Chris Potter on saxophone, Steve Nelson on vibes, Robin on trombone, Dave on bass, and, and either Billy Keelson or later Nate Smith on, on drums. And this is a video from, uh, this is from Newport in 2002, I believe. And this is a piece that I heard you guys play live. And Dave said, oh, well, we'd love to do a composition of Robins now. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of uh, everybody's writing in the band, you know. And anyway, uh, you know, well, we did a lot of tunes by Chris and we did, we did Candlelight Visual by Steve. And now we'd like to do some by Robin and this is entitled Metamorphose. <laughs> You so sound that's just like him. That's well, thanks, man. <laughs> well, you know, in the words of Louis Armstrong, Robin, when two people sound alike, one is an innovator and one is an imitator. <laughs> so, so here we go with Dave Holland Quintet 18 years ago with Robin Eubanks uh, and Robin's composition, Metamorphos.
Sometimes it's hard to go back and listen to yourself, but Robin, that was epic. That was some kind of solo, man. And uh, and whose whose hair whose hair was that? <laughs> Billy Kilson's hair is borrowing. <laughs> right. Um, so you know what occurs to me hearing that are a couple of things. Uh, so if you'll indulge me, one of them is you and Dave Holland and Steve Coleman, among other people, are to me some more modern improvising musicians who've really gotten into what we call odd meters things that are not just four four and three four can you speak to that in your own development and how much interacting with dave might have influenced it well um i started getting into that's the meters and stuff when i was very young actually when i was like 15 really uh, huh. or was it was it 15 well hearing uh yeah, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Oh yeah, John McLaughlin. I think those albums came out around 1970 or something, or early, definitely early 70s. Yeah, Inner Mounting Flame with Billy Cobham on drums and Jan Hammer on keyboards and Rick Laird on bass and. Who's a photographer now, Rick Laird? Yeah, yeah, he was a he was a photographer then too. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. But you you heard them playing in some other meters, and your interest was piqued. Yeah, because. Is you know similar to like when I first picked the trombone. There was just curiosity. I was like, "What are they doing? And how can I?" How, just trying to figure stuff out like a puzzle, and um, I couldn't tap my foot to it. And I was like, "What are they doing? How do they know where they are?" And then I just started learning that oh, it's it's not even it's not four beats a measure. It's right. This, well, like the piece we just heard, Metamorphose, well, what meter or meters is that in? 
Um, most of it's in five, I think. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and do you tend as a composer to try to write a piece in one meter, like five, four or nine, four, or do you prefer to mix it up or does it just depend on the music? Yeah, I just, I just write what I hear and I, I figure out what the time signature is when I'm, when I'm writing it down. Oh, so you basically have to transcribe your own stuff <laughs> in a way. I just, I just hear stuff and I just, I like to sing it into the microphone now. Right. I mean, back then, this, that was, was a, I guess when I wrote that, that was like before iPhones and all that kind of stuff, I think. I forget when iPhones yeah. started. Well, yeah, they just had the 10th year anniversary not too long ago. So, okay. um, so it was, um, I used to just write it down, I just sing it into like a tape recorder or something like that, or mm -hmm. whatever recording device you had at the moment. And, and I would just sing what I heard. And then I okay. didn't know what meter it was in until I tried to write it down for other people to play. Beautiful. So, so the point is, it's the opposite of what I might have thought. You didn't think, I'm going to do something in seven. You thought, this is what I hear, and then you have to count it up and literally find out what meter am I hearing this in. Yeah, I remember I used to, when Smitty and I were roommates, sometimes I would write stuff and I was asking, I said, what meter, how would you subdivide this, you know, if you were going to play it? Or maybe what, what meter do you think this is in? And you, you had to figure it out as, as, as I wrote it down. Well, speaking of Steve Coleman, just a, a basic question. What does M bass mean? And were you ever a member of the band Five Elements? Um, well, the, the, the whole way that the whole M bass thing started, we, was, we were most of Steve, Smitty, and I were playing with uh, Dave's band. And we had a, we had a, a, a double bill gig with Jack D. Jeanette's band. Oh, and, yeah. And Greg Osby was playing in the band then. And, and, was that, uh, excuse me, was that, was that the band with, with Lonnie Plaxico and Mick Goodrick and Gary Thomas? Yeah, probably. That yeah. was quite a band of a totally different type, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we, so we used to hang out a lot with Greg, obviously, back then, and, and Lonnie. Yeah. And, and um, Oh, that's right. Because when we had the, uh, we used to do a lot of stuff. We used to do a lot, to do a lot of gigs with Lonnie. Okay. And um, so we we flew back. We had, I think it was on a private plane or something, or, or at least a rented plane, I should say. Because I think it was just the two, the two bands are on the plane coming back for some reason. That's what I remember. And then we were talking about trying to come up with some music that represented our generation so we didn't have to play like standards if we get all the time if we got together because because we all grew up listening to rock and funk music and and we were trying to combine it with jazz and stuff so we we're trying to come up with some music that represented what we wanted to do and the music that we were playing together mm -hmm. so um um I came up with the idea that we should name it because I said, if we don't name it, then a writer is going to get a hold of it and call it some post bebop, whatever, you know, whatever they want to call it. Some BS term that you might not feel. Right, right. I said, if we, if we name it, then we can control it and say what's, what's in it. Okay. What it, we can, we can define it if we, sure. we name it. So Steve got a, Everybody agreed, and Steve got a thesaurus, and I mean, people were throwing around all kinds of stuff, and he came up with this, this macro basic array of structured extemporizations, which basically means you can do it anything you want. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it um, so we said we said oh that sounds nice and so and then we just use the you know the acronym just be m m base we said that sounds cool so we so said, i'm sorry that was m base was an acronym for what exactly again oh macro basic array of structured extemporizations you heard it here kids all you m base fans that's <laughs> that's what was really happening and kim clark once told me that the first ever rehearsal of five elements was in her living room in queens does that strike a chord at all um i was i did what well, i wasn't in the 
first uh, incarnation. Elements. Yeah, but I, I did some tours with them later sure. on, and I played on a couple of the recordings and stuff like that. Well, so then here's here's a question. I mean, the rock and funk is all on one side of the room. How do you balance playing a really straight ahead gig like Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers with playing that kind of music that you were playing with Steve Coleman, with your own bands, with Dave Holland? I mean, I guess it's just you have to go in with a different head, right? Yeah, I always, when I do lectures at colleges and stuff and talk about that kind of thing, I always talk about being multilinguistic. It's like if, because, because I travel all over the world and I'm frequently, especially in Europe, in a situation where I'm the only one that doesn't know what people are saying. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if I'm in, if, if, if you can speak, if you speak German, and French and English, and which a lot of many, many Europeans speak several languages because all the countries are smaller and they're closer together and they're not American. <laughs> so, so, they can, so they can have a conversation that goes from one language into the next language into the next language. And then they may say a couple of words in English and then okay. I can smile and nod my head because I know what they're talking about. But everybody knows what they're saying because they're all multilinguistic. So musically speaking, I like being multilinguistic. Okay. I can play. I grew up playing funk and rock. When I, but I, you know, I studied classical music with sure. trombone. And then, as, of course, when I got into jazz, I was just playing with, with Art Blakey. I was started playing, you know, and hanging with Slide and. Right. All that stuff is playing real traditional jazz. So to me, you're just like speaking a different language. But like in the music that I write, I try to combine them all together, which was what M bass was supposedly originally supposed to be about. I it's see. Just well, let's, let's, let's play here. another another little track, if that's all right. Um, so let me let me get it right. I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry. What what do you what do you call the trio with Kenwood again? E B three. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is, um, was, was that always Oren Evans as the keyboard player? Were there other folks doing it too? Uh, yeah, Michelle Rosewoman did it, did a tour with us, a couple of tours with us okay. in Europe and things like that and some gigs in the States. Okay. But Oren was the original right. player for sure. Okay, um, so Kenwood, Kenwood Denard on drums and Oren Evans on keyboards and Robin Eubanks on trombone. I believe this is a live performance uh, of, that, of that trio um, and this is a piece called Pentacourse. Also, Ken Woods, uh, with that band, he would he would play the bass lines on a keyboard. Oh, yeah. While he played drums with the other three limbs. Yeah, have you ever heard him do Teen Town, just like that? Yeah, I think I have, yeah. He used to, he used to do like one man band stuff all the time. He used to oh, loft in, in New York in the, tw yeah. the 20s. I thought what was funny about it, you know, knowing Kenwood, I mean, I had all these years with him uh, with the Gil Evans band and he's a genius and he's also extremely funny. And to me, so Kenwood would call his solo performances MRO. I said, what does that stand for? He says, Meta Rhythmic Orchestra. But meanwhile, that was all Kenwood. <laughs> That's Kenwood with Velcro around his neck to sing. Sing the yeah, play, yeah. playing playing a keyboard, playing the bass line to Jocko's bass line on Teen Town with his left hand and his other three limbs, you know, doing the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, he had a whole other thing. He would he had a double bass set up and he had a snare taped to one of the bass drum heads so he could wow. play bass and snare. So then he could play chords with one hand. Unbelievable. And play bass lines with the left hand and sing while he played like bass. You know, there's only one person I've ever met who could sub for Kenwood doing most of that stuff, and that would probably be Ronnie Barrage. Oh, Ronnie does it? I didn't know. Ronnie, that. I, Ronnie was in our band, Magnus, the band that Kim Clark and I have had for 20 years. And we did a tour with Ronnie, and we didn't know, well, I didn't know until Ronnie came out on the road. He brought a wave drum and a keyboard. And Ronnie is capable of playing keyboards, drums, and singing at the same time and doing all three of them well. Oh, I didn't. I had no idea. But, it's, but of course, he's a real individual, as is Kenwood. So I don't think anybody can cop Kenwood's stuff, you know. Um, well, let's, let's hear this, and then maybe we could talk, talk about it when, after we've heard it. Uh, Pentacourse, EB3 with Robin Eubanks, Oren Evans, and Kenwood Denard.
say that's some killing music and it's also very fresh and it's it expands the mind of any listener whether they have jazz understanding or they're just a person who, who likes the music you know i'm listening to it i have to say there are a lot of great trombone players out there but most of them are not creating their own kind of new brand of jazz or funk or whatever you want to call it in the way that you are i think it's totally original music robin oh thanks you know i'm just uh, you know, I don't know what 
people are doing. I'm just I'm just trying to be myself. That's and, and that's, that's that's all. I'm I'm not trying to chart any new anything. I'm just trying to be me. You're doing and, well, but what I guess well you uh, are an original. That's I guess that's how it comes out. Yeah, but you know everybody's an original. I think if people sure. just open themselves up to that's, that's one of the things you know as, as a Buddhist, as you know. Yes, is you know everybody's karma. Everybody has different karma. Nobody has the same karma as somebody else. And if you you find a way to express yourself, express you, the uniqueness of your life musically, there's no way you're going to sound like anybody else because you're not like anybody else. Sure. Actually, so, you know what? Steve Coleman said something to us when we were teenagers at Banff, and he was teaching us a class of either an ensemble or a you know, room full of saxophonists. And Steve says something like, there's no way anybody can ever play like Bird because it's not that time, it's not that city, it's not those people around him. You can't put yourself in the place that, that Charlie Parker was in. And I just went to his gravesite before I left Kansas City recently. And it was it's heavy to be there. A friend of mine said, let me take you on a Charlie Parker tour. And he took me to all the houses that Charlie Parker lived in with his mother, Addie, and all the schools he went to, where he'd say, see that green field? Well, there was a house on that lot where Bird used to live. They, you know, the house is not there. But mm -hmm. it, it was very interesting to me. Steve's saying, well, anybody can play Bird's music, and nobody is going to sound like him because they don't have the same life. No, that that's definitely true. So, yeah, you know, this is, but, you know, it's, it doesn't have to just be with music. People can be, you can be very creative, even if you, if you're an office worker or if you're sure. a sanitation worker, any, you know, whatever you do, you just really find out what's, what's unique about your life and find a way to express it in and, and sure. whatever way that you do. Fortunately, well, now, let me, music. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me, let me ask a question. Let me try to apply your multilingual concept here. Um, you know, I know we're a little short on time, but I hope we can get to a bunch of things before we all have to go. Uh, and that's for our producer also. Can I reel off a few names of folks that you worked with and maybe you could give a bite-sized reaction or summary to what your experience was? Sure. Okay, Elvin Jones. My favorite drummer of all time. I'm right with you there. No offense <laughs> to anybody else, but gotta be. I, just, I, just, it was, I had such a great time to working with him, it was one of the golden memories of my life. Just to, you know, because the fact that I was able to play with half of my favorite band of all time, John Coltrane's quartet, but to play with McCoy, with McCoy Tyner's band and playing with Elvin. And, and I just, it was just so amazing to stand next to Elvin, watching them play. And, you know, just imagine what they were like when they, I mean, instead of them playing with my sad ass, they had John Coltrane. <laughs> so <laughs> just, I can't imagine, I wish I had been able to see them play live. That Yeah, that quartet. I know yeah. when you talk to somebody like Dave Liebman, who was really there and into that and saw the band a lot. In fact, Dave said he went to Birdland the only night in history when Elvin didn't show up and Paul Motion sat in and did the gig. <laughs> Because they were on a double bill with Bill Evans's trio, so you know uh, John McCoy, Jimmy Garrison, and Motion. That's, that's, that's like night and day. <laughs> I know it's it's really different. Well, okay, here here are a couple others. Now, does this have anything to do with the Philly connection? You're playing with Sun Ra, or was that just much later, separate separate issue? No, that was early. That was before I moved to New York. Even no kidding. Okay. Yeah. That was like one of the, actually, it was my, my first recording was with Sun Ra. I didn't know that. What's that called? Do you remember? Other Worlds. Of course, Other Worlds. <laughs> well, and, and it was so bizarre because uh, we went to, we, he piled us all into a van because he, he, he's in Philly also, another Philly. Germantown, movie. right? Yeah, Germantown on Morton Street. Yep. And we piled in there and we went up to the studio in New York and he and he would just he said, you play this, you play that, you play this, you play that. When I point to you, you solo. When I go like this, you stop. And that's how we did the record. And, it, uh -huh. and I was I was amazed. One really quick Sun Ra story. 
is because I went there, I had heard about them and I used to see them a lot at this club called the Foxhole in, um, at the, on the University of Penn. And um, it was just really out avant-garde stuff, but uh, he was he was sitting there with all of, I went to his house, the house on Morton Street for the rehearsal. Actually, Vincent Chancy, the French horn player was yeah. playing in there and you know John Gilmore was there, Marshall Allen. And um, they were all on the floor and looking up at this guy and he was sitting in a chair and um, he was on the phone with, uh, they, had, they had a tour book. They were trying to put a tour together and he was trying to, he was talking to the Canadian uh, um, customs and they were telling him that he had, had to get visas for everybody in the band. You know, it is like, you know, who knows how many people, 20 people in the band and he, and he said, these, he said, all these rules are for earthlings. What, <laughs> said, what, what rules do you have for omnipotent beings? Right. And then he started arguing with them some more. And then he said, of all the planets I've been to, this is the worst one. And slammed that's, the phone. That's the, that's the famous Sun Ra quote. I heard it was he got pulled over by a cop driving, you know, this is the worst planet I've ever been on. Maybe he used it more than once, but I was yeah. there when he said yeah. that. Well, that's 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 deep and it's hilarious. Um, you know, I just want to point out to the listeners uh, really quickly that uh, Live Jazz KC does accept donations, and if you donate tonight on either Venmo or on the website, all the money goes to the musicians, namely me and Robin. And in a period of no work, uh, I encourage you to do that. No amount is too small, so please consider making a donation if you're enjoying this. Um, okay, a couple other people, Robin. What about Eddie Palmieri? Oh, that was a great experience because I love Latin music. I remember I used to play in, in Latin bands in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. I knew Rafi Hernandez and La Contraria. And um, Earl Gardner used to play in that band. Okay. Earl, was Earl, Earl from Philly originally? No, but he went to school at Temple University. Ah, okay. And that's where I met him, was at Temple University. He used to, he used to weigh like 300 pounds. They used to call him Big Bird back then. Right. And uh, then he lost all the way, but he used to come down and, and, and do these gigs. And um, so I grew up, I, I loved playing Latin music because it was one of the few uh, musics that the trombone was like a, a major voice. In the right. Horns. I remember one, I went to this sex, this horn, this uh, recording I did with, uh, called, with La Lupe, this singer, this Latin singer, and Barry Rogers was on it. Oh yeah. I think Sam Burtis and Jose Rodriguez and me. And um, and then I, you know, I was waiting there. I said, so, so when's I said, when the rest of the horns are when the rest of the horns coming? Who else is on the session? They said, No, this is it. I said, What do you mean this is it? He said, the section is just four trombones. I was like, What? <laughs> I had never even heard of that. I said, how can you, they got a whole a set, the whole all the horns is just four trombones on the full full on the recording? Yeah. You know, it, ha it happened to me because there was a free concert outside of Lincoln Center when I was a teenager, and I went to see it. It was Manny Oquendo. And yeah, I guess, I the, the, the Libre. Yeah, and, and it was five trombones, no saxes, no trumpets. And I know, I can tell you this much, the, the trombones were killing, and I know for a fact two of them were your friends Steve Ture and Papo Vasquez. Yeah. And the other three guys were hanging. I mean, it was an... I, I never had seen a band before like that that was so trombone centric with no saxophones and yeah, no trombone. I stopped on that band with Jerry Gonzalez and Andy Gonzalez was on, both on there. Well, you reminded me of something. So um, another guy that I want to get to that you played in a wonderful band uh, with, uh, great Michael Brecker, your, your homeboy from Philly, the Quintet, which was a really unique group, which I believe Gil Goldstein mostly did the arrangements for. Is that right? He did the orchestrations, yeah. In the yeah, of Michael's music, and it was yeah. a very unusual band. It was it was trombone, trumpet, bass, clarinet, maybe Charlie Pillow playing oboe and English horn, and and um, and it was Michael with kind of a small, almost chamber music y kind of big band. But with, I had, with, a, had a string quartet was in there too. There was a string quartet and the rhythm section was real funky and they could do anything. Adam Rogers and was it Antonio Sanchez maybe yeah, on drums? Yeah, yeah, John Patitucci. John Patitucci. So this incredible band, but I want to bridge this real quick if I might. When um, when Barry Rogers died, he was kind of a friend of mine because I'm, I used to play with his son, Chris Rogers, who's a mm -hmm. great trumpet player. 
And so when Barry passed away, I remember walking through Central Park in the rain to go to his memorial service on the Upper West Side. And the two things I will never forget from that service, Eddie Palmieri got up and he said, kind of in unspoken parentheses, guess what? It was not a Latin cat. What he said was, as far as I'm concerned, the Latin jazz trombone style was invented by Barry Rogers out of the mouth of Eddie Palmieri. And that was a lesson. You know, I had no, to go no, check. No, no. Yeah, Eddie, Barry was amazing, and um, and uh, so was Eddie. Man, he's he's. I mean, one of my one of my favorite uh, songs is uh, this was an album called I think the Son of Latin Music, and and he sounds like McCoy Tyner on this on this song. Oh, and, I bet. Uh, I can't I can't remember it. The name well, of it. well, do you you know what Michael Brecker said um, in tribute to Barry at that that service? It was hilarious. He said, Michael Brecker got up there and the first thing he said was, Barry Rogers was the only Jew I've ever known who knew how to fix a car. <laughs> Out of the mouth of Michael. Um, so that's the bridge to number one. Maybe you could speak uh, briefly about that great band, the Quintet. And also, I don't even know if you remember this. I imagine you do, Robin, but you've done so many great things in your career so far. Do you remember playing uh, Manteca featuring Michael Brecker on Saturday Night Live with an all-star big band conducted by Quincy Jones? Yeah, yeah. And that, I seem to remember it was you and Steve Ture and Michael and I, I don't know, maybe Jerry Dodge. Dave, Dave Taylor, Keith O'Quinn. Unbelievable. I think he was on there. It was, a, it was a, Frank West was on it. And that was the chart of Manteca that Quincy had recorded on You've Got a Bad Girl in the 70s. But then he pulled it out and had Michael as the soloist, and it worked unbelievably well. It was very exciting. Yeah, playing with Michael was like a dream come true. And, sure. Uh, he, you know, he's he's one of the one of the best sax greatest saxophone players I ever got a chance to play with. I actually got a chance to do a uh, a uh, tour with uh, Don Grolnick's band, and the, the horn section was with uh, Mike and Randy and me and Marty Ehrlich. Oh yeah. Also, and Don Elias was in the band. Peter Erskine was playing. I forget who was playing bass, but and then Don Gromick. And um, so I got to really st stand next to him and play. And, and, um, and I, I love the Brecker brothers because, you know, playing all the funk stuff when, in the seventies when I was coming up in the school, oh, yeah, sure. school and stuff and then this horn section stuff. Was, I was like, wow, these guys are amazing and this and all this stuff. <laughs> and I like their the writing, the arranging. They were like really ahead of their time in terms of, of, of horn section stuff. And um and uh, and and Mike was just an incredible player. And then they had, you know, he did everything. He played with James Brown and thought Fred Wesley told me Mike did a lot of those recordings and everything. And I, then I re also re remember that that night on Saturday Night Live, it was just really amazing. And I think that was a night um, Nelson Mandela was getting out of out of prison in South Africa. Oh, oh and that's part of what it was for. And Quincy mentioned something about that also that I night. See. But it was but it was great, and and I really miss Mike. And Mike was one of the people that really encouraged me in terms of using electronics and effects on my horn because he's he had the e we and all that stuff, and he right. told me about this looper called the jam man which i used for many years so i used to talk with him about all that kind of stuff for sure well beautiful well so a couple of questions about trombone players if you don't mind so when you were playing on metamorphos in that video we showed with dave holland i noticed near the end you were doing some singing into the horn and some multiphonics which makes me want to ask you uh is there any connection to roswell rudd or albert mangelsdorf with you doing that or did you kind of come on it by yourself um i definitely heard them do it i heard albert mangelsdorf i, I met him a few times in germany when i was playing with art blakey early, early back back with the big band in 1980 would it be safe to say that albert played more different tones on the trombone at one time than any human who's ever lived yeah, he was he was a very interesting, and he, and he had he did like a trio album with uh, Elvin. With Elvin, I forget who was playing bass. I remember it was Paula Danielson, and the album's called The Wide Point. 
Yeah. I, and you know, the reason I remember, I mean, I do own it, but that's not the reason. It's because one of the songs on it is called, I'm going to take you to my hospital and cut your liver out. <laughs> that's the name of one of the hey, Mangles Dwarf originals. I think it was something called the Up and Down Man or something. I forget. Uh -huh. But that might have been another record either. But 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 Albert, he 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 pulled me aside and talked. He talked to me a few times and everything. I remember, I remember watching him. He was like all up with a camera watching me play on the right in the front row. I was like, what's what's this cat doing? <laughs> well, you know, he 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 dug it. But I mean, Albert somehow found a way to play six or seven notes at a time on the trombone, not just two or three. No, and he was he, he was he was an innovator for sure. And no doubt. There's a lot of those judges, there's a guy named Con, Con, Connie Bauer, Conrad Bauer, who's uh -huh. another, I think, but he, I think he might have been in East Germany. Right. And there's a lot, a lot of those German trombone players who were, were doing a lot of multiphonic stuff. Oh, but not just I, Okay. And I started getting into it just because it would just give me different sounds and different things. Okay. I wasn't really, I haven't really developed it to the level that I really want to yet because. Mm -hmm. Well, you got the pandemic, man. You can do it now. This is true. I guess lots of stuff I can work on. <laughs> well, now what about this? So I've kind of had a cliche that I have spouted um, over the years that I feel like the three trombonists of everybody alive who have the most technical ability, not that that matters, but who do things that pretty much nobody else can do are you, Conrad Herwig, and Scott Whitfield. I feel like you are three virtuosi of the modern trombone who have extended the instrument in ways that it really hadn't been before. Um, and there are a couple other trombone players with kind of extraordinary technique like Michael Dees and Elliot Mason. And I just wonder coming out of, well, I guess if you go back, Frank Rosalino was one of the scariest guys and Carl Fontana and JJ in his own way. Uh, what do you have to say about overcoming what might be the cumbersomeness of the trombone to develop an incredible facility and technique uh, like the folks that I just mentioned and yourself? Um, well, when I heard JJ and um, there's a guy named Aaron Pryor, no, it was Arthur Pryor, Aaron Pryor was a boxer. Arthur Pryor, he used to be in on the Sousa bands Okay. And he's playing like Blue Bells of Scotland and, and all this kind of stuff. Like just an amazing technician on trombone. When I heard him do, him do that kind of stuff and I heard JJ and then you realize that, and then I heard Slide, when I, when I started hanging with Slide Live, you can, you know, it's a lot harder to do, but you can do anything on the trombone. Well, you can do anything on the trombone, but you've you've, you've there's a lot of cats like you 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 mentioned Elliot Mason and Mike Dees and the, you know the cats is another uh, uh, Corey Wilcox who was one of my students at uh, Oberlin. Okay, there's a lot of cats that's really continuing the lineage of the trombone for sure, and right. um and you know and, and I'm so happy for that. I remember Curtis said that when I when I came, I remember one time he pulled me aside and said. I've been waiting for somebody like you to come along. What well, that means, that means so much. And that meant the world to me. And sure. I, was, I said, Curtis Fuller is saying this. Well, unbelievable. Well, and that leads us right back to one of the first three jazz records you bought in Philly was Thermo, which was that re-release with the, the great sextet with Freddie and Wayne and Curtis. Um, and so uh, can you, you, we, you told me this before we started tonight, that you actually play with the Art Blakey Big Band way back in 1980, six years before you joined the Messengers. Is that correct? Right. And can you speak to that? What was what was the Big Band about? Well, uh, they uh, they were trying to do some auditions. I remember they were doing auditions to, to, to do the Big Band. My brother Kevin called me from Berkeley because he was in Berkeley with Branford. And he told me that he said, they're, they're putting a big band, Art Blakey's putting a big band together and um, you know, they're having auditions at McKell's. Which, oh, on, on, up on 95th and Columbus. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, I, and I had never heard, I'd never heard him live, Art live. The first time I saw Art live was the night I went to audition for him. No kidding. Yeah, so we went to McKell's and it was like 10 horn, 10, 20 horn players lined up against the wall and everybody came up on stage and played a couple of choruses. 
<clears throat> on something. And actually, I think he, he really wanted to get Clifford Adams that night, but Clifford Adams was busy working. He, he couldn't make the tour. So I think he got me settled for me. <laughs> I think that's how I actually got in the band. Were you the only trombone or were there two trombones in that, in that big band? Just, just one. Okay. Yeah, just, just me and the two trumpets was uh, Valerie and Winton. Right, Valerie Ponomarev. And yeah. how um, how were you informed that you got the gig? Uh, I, I don't even remember. Maybe so somebody called me. Maybe from the, I know I know it wasn't Art, but right. maybe, maybe maybe Kevin told me. I forget who told me because Kevin got the gig, and then it's uh, Bradford, and he's like, "Gonna get gonna get Bradford's brother Winton." Right. That was like one of our trivia questions of because uh, Art had his sextet and he added two two groups of two pairs of brothers to his band, and it was okay. you know, Wynton Bramford, Kevin, and me, and and it was John Ramsey also played. He had a second drummer. Right. Uh, some songs also, so it was uh, it was it was an amazing experience because that's when I got to tra traveling around Europe with the. Uh, with art and doing all the crazy stuff he was doing. I used to hang out with him sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, well, now, how, how, how does that big band time in 1980, how does that relate to you then actually joining the Jazz Messengers in 1986? Oh, it was, it was, it took, it was a, a lot of space between there because, you know, I was, I was like, man, you need to, you're, you're, you're cause he's, he, at that point, he was always using alto, tenor and Tr trumpet. Right. He, was, he didn't use a trombone for a long time. And I was like, man, you, you, you're fit. You most, the best band you ever had had a trombone in it. You, you should get now, I, I'm trying to remember, did anybody play trombone with art after Curtis Fuller before you and Frank Lacey? Uh, was there anybody in, in there? I, I can't think of anybody. Well, I, I forget when it was, but I think I think Slide may have they have done it a little bit. Oh, Maybe, oh you yeah. know, I I know Slide did it because Slide told me he said he was terrified, and I said, "Well, man, I don't." I said, "I don't remember any records of of you with with uh, with Art," and I and I wish that I I wish that I had heard you with the Messengers. I said, "Who was in the band?" And this was at the Jazz Standard. Um, and Slide said, well, it was Art, McCoy, McCoy Tyner, Junie Booth, Joe Henderson, Bill Hardman, and Slide Hampton. Wow. And, and Slide said, and this is the first time I ever met Slide. What happened is I said to the waitress, look, I really came to listen. Would you please put me right down front? It was to hear the Gil Evans Project, not the Gil Evans Band, the Ryan Truesdale thing with all the original music, <laughs> mm -hmm. the French horns and flutes. And, and so... She says to me, well, you can have that seat right in front of the bandstand, or you can sit here. And I looked at here, and here was an empty chair next to Slide Hampton. So I said, I'll sit here. <laughs> and, Excuse me, Slide, I don't mean to bother you, sophisticated giant, new world, blah, 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 blah. And he took some pictures with me, and he was beautiful. And that was maybe four or five years ago. Um, but, uh, but that's what he said. He said that he was in an R. Blakey band and actually, I, there is some YouTube of it, which is uh, audio only, but it's Billy Harper rather than Joe Henderson, but it's Passion it's Dance. Yeah. yeah, it's Boy Tyner's Passion I think, Dance. I think, I, think, I think Steve Teray may have done some, did some stuff with with, with uh, art also. He, but, but, and, you know, after, and then I think after I did it, then there was a, a, a string of trombone players. Um, or actually, I forget when Bone was it. Oh yeah, once we did the big band, but then he started using, it was Tim Williams. Oh yeah. He he did it for, for, for a while back when the, the John Toussaint days and- With what, with, with Donald Harrison? And and Donald and Terrence, yeah. Right, well, so um, I guess my question was, so you stayed for two years. You did a, a nice hitch with art, 1986 to 1988. Uh, was the band constantly working in New York and Europe and Japan? And constantly, nonstop. So it was like a, it was like a full time gig. You had to turn yeah, down a yeah, ton yeah. of other we, stuff we, in New York, we, right? We, we would do two months in Europe. Two yeah. months nonstop. Oh yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, we we we, we worked a lot. In, in well, now let me ask you a question, a, a blunt question. Given the 
modern cast to most of your composing, did you have any compositions that would work for the messengers that you played? I wrote some stuff for the big band. Uh huh. And uh, we played them a few times. We didn't play them a whole lot. Bobby Watson was music director then. But uh, when I went, when I did the sextet, I was I was a music director for the sextet. Right, because and for our listeners, particularly people who are not players, Art Blakey always designated an MD within the band. Correct. Yeah. So it, it had been Bobby Watson, it had been Benny Golson, it probably had been Wayne Shorter, but often the person who was doing a lot of the writing, correct? Yeah, but I, I didn't, I think I wrote a song, and then some people wrote some other thing, Benny Green wrote something when, while, while I was in the band, and um, but I would, I would put the set together, you know, because art, and we would rehearse the band and stuff like that, but art wouldn't make any rehearsals. So oh, he wouldn't. he'd have to call stuff that he, he could, if he didn't hear it in two, two times we went through it, he would just cancel it. Well, what do you think about this? I mean, Bobby is my friend in Kansas City and I saw him right before the lockdown. We were trying to record some of his music, but I saw an interview online just the other day where Bobby was talking about his experience playing with art. And he said, they would play a new piece and he said art would be terrible on the first night and he would be killing it by the end of one week with new stuff. Yeah, that's that's true because he wouldn't he didn't he wouldn't come to the rehearsals. So if he couldn't hear it, but I but I the, the way I went got around that I would write the stuff that I wrote or brought in to the band for my stuff was stuff that kind of sounded like messengers kind of music. And so then, and then you, then, you, you were multilingual, you came in and spoke <laughs> that language. Yeah, I guess. But yeah. also, also, I would bring stuff to the band that he played on a long time ago. OK. Oh, you mean you would bring in old Messengers pieces? Or not Messengers, just, just maybe some stuff from uh, other, other, other recordings. I, I'm not, I don't know if he played on it, but there was a song. Um, uh, did we do, I think we did Kilo. Kilo. There's a J.J. Johnson song that, that's on the Miles Davis album. Art Blakey's on that. Okay. And um, and I think we have brought in um, Air Reedus, one of Freddie Hubbard's songs, which oh, I yeah. love. I think it's also called Aries sometimes. Yeah. I'm not sure what Ariatus means, but. I think it's a person who was born of, in the Aries sign. Okay, so, so so Art was was basically open to the cats in the band creating the repertoire aside from the obvious things like Blues yeah, March. Yeah, they did it. Hit. And yeah, we, we played Blues March, and 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 Long Came Betty and Moaning. We had to do at least one of those every every set. I see. Okay, well he was keeping the hits mixed with, uh, but it seems seems to me, Art never stopped playing new music the whole time yeah, I, messengers existed yeah well, they, he, they kept they kept it kind of fresh they you know they were i remember when i before i joined walter davis had a lot of songs in there we were, we were playing like uranus and that kind and of jody stuff. jody yeah, yeah. well so, so is this is this true robin i mean i never got to play in the band but i heard that at one point art said regarding people who were in the messengers if you don't write you're gone if you don't what? If you don't write, you're gone. <laughs> Is there anything to that? I mean, I, I, don't, think, I don't think that was true because we didn't we didn't write because he, he didn't rehearse, so you you had to write very very simple stuff. Right, but I guess, I guess it was more of a format where if you got that gig and you were a writer, you had to kind of see your own opportunity and bring your tunes in, right? Yeah, I mean. That's that's true. I mean, the the thing that I that I that I got took the most from art, playing with art, was yes. learning to play solo, just by yourself. Oh, you mean he just leave you out there, but on, yeah, on. after each set, you 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 would call it the creature feature, meaning oh, you, yeah. you're your ballad. So it'll be your ballad. But before the ballad, but for him, it would be his time to, for a break. I remember we used to play at Sweet Basil's all the time. And Sweet Basil's, the dressing room was outside the back through the kitchen and, and in this other, uh, through this other door in this room next to, 
so it was my turn to play. The first time I did it, I remember uh, was doing. I was featured on the ballad. I, I think I, I used to play Lover Man and stuff like because JJ played it. Sure. And, um, and I played this intro. And then I brought the song in with a big downbeat and nobody came in and I turned around and there was nobody there. So I just kept playing. And then when he, then I noticed he would, you hear them snares and that means he, it means he was, because you know, before I was, I was in front of the band, I didn't turn and, and the mic is here. So I didn't turn around to see if anybody was there. I just thought if I brought the band and they would come in. But and you nobody, didn't realize they were all gone. Nobody was on the stage because he would take that time to go back and hang out with his boys. Yeah. <laughs> so he would leave the stage and then you'd see, which I started noticing later, when he would leave the stage, all his, all his guys who knew what was up, they start filing out <laughs> into well, the dressing know, I mean, room. The filing out is one thing, but one time at Sweet Basil, I was really shocked because I saw the filing in in a way I never saw in my life. It was Steve Lacey's sextet with all those crazy guys from Paris. Mm -hmm. And it was um, Bobby Few and Jean-Jacques Avenel and uh, probably you no know, Johnson before John Betch and his wife, Irene A. and Steve Potts, the other saxophone player, and that band, they started a set. There were maybe two cats on stage and they'd be halfway into the first tune and two of them would still be standing at the bar. And I thought, man, this is some really loose shit. I've never seen a band get on the bandstand so loose. I'd say it probably took anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes for all six cats to be on the bandstand. Wow. So that was, that was kind of a lesson in itself, you know, instead of like, hey, man, we all have to hit together. But I'm imagining you played your cadenza on Lover Man with your eyes closed, which is why you didn't know right. it all split. Right, it's exactly. But, but, it, but it, learned, it taught me how to just play complete solo and, and to develop, which is one of my favorite ways to play now. To play it, solo trombone. Yeah, just play by myself or, or setting up a song or something. I love doing that. And it's one of my favorite ways to play. And especially with my band, I can do it and I can use, bring in effects and do different things and, sure. and really develop into something completely different. I mean, I used to do it so much on one of the, with my band, I'd have to turn and ask them, what song are we playing? <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't even remember what song we, I was supposed to go into. Well, this was... brings up an important point. I mean, those of us who love jazz and who've listened to it for years are familiar really with electronics on the trumpet, mainly because of Miles Davis and Randy Brecker, I think. Miles Davis on Bitches Brew and, and beyond and in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Randy, well, heavy metal bebop, him and Mike, unbelievable. Yeah. Like, like they weren't funky enough without electronics and they got even funkier with them, I thought. Um, but is there any precedent that you can think of for, for improvising trombonists using electronics? And I don't mean non jazz cats like Stuart Dempster or somebody, but I mean, jazz oriented trombonists who were using electronics on stage before you were. The first person I heard use on the recording, the electronics was JJ. Really? He, he played. Mr. Clean, the ba -da 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 -da, ba -da -da -ba -da -ba -da -da Freddie Hubbard song. Uh -huh. He did that on the album, I think, called Pinnacles. Okay. On I think on um, uh, Pablo, I think it's on the Pablo label, and that was the first time I heard anybody recording. But but um, uh, Al Gray, back when I was hanging with Al, back when I mentioned him earlier in the interview, he took one of my mouthpieces and he told me that, because Al really, really liked me a lot. He gave me horns and did all kinds of stuff for me. Beautiful. And um, he, he's, and he, he knew that I was playing with all these funk bands and, you know, and for me, it always felt weird growing up listening. I was listening to Led Zeppelin and Grand Funk Railroad and Black Sabbath and yep. all these crazy bands. And I had a, a, a trombone. I was like, what am I gonna do with this? And, um, but he, he, this is back when they, they used to use Barkus Berry pickups on 
horns, like a lot of people in, in Frank Zappa's uh, horn section would use those. Or oh, maybe Bruce Fowler or Tom Malone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 would use those, and and uh, Eddie Harris was using doing all kinds of stuff with right. And, oh, and actually, even Sonny Stitt played like the varitone, like I guess which was yeah, like an octavider yeah. on the tenor. <clears throat> yeah, it was through this period, and I guess Al was doing something with it because. Oh yeah. He took my mouthpiece and they they drilled a hole in it. So I gave him a mouthpiece that I didn't use because yes. And they would put this pickup on top on this. They would drill a hole and put this thing on, it, and then they put this pickup on it that you'd have to cover with a plug or something if you weren't using the pickup. And um, that was like the first time I started doing that stuff. But it, but it was really fragile and it broke really easy and it. But um, but but that was that was like the early stages, very very my first forays into into doing that. Well, so, well foray rhymes with touré, and my, that's my next question. Um, I'll put it bluntly: there are a lot of great trombone players out there. For me personally, I have no shame in saying, for the last thirty years, my two favorite living trombone players are you and Steve Touré, and I know you guys have a mutual friendship and admiration society. And I feel like I heard you with a quintet once with the two of you together. Did that happen? Yeah, yeah. It was one of, when I was recording for this label and um, my, my first recording session and um, JMT and um, was, it was a German label. And uh, I, I did I did my I did my first record and then my for my second record I wanted to do this two trombone thing with Steve and the record label was didn't want to do it and everything but I wanted to do it anyway and yeah. um, it was so we did this album called Dedication and uh, we dedicated it to Woody Shaw and to uh, uh, SGI, Soka Gaga International. Steve, Steve is a person that got one of the people that got me started chanting and became becoming a Buddhist also. Okay. And um, and so and I think we we did I, I'm not, I'm not, did I mention Woody Shaw? Yes. Woody had just had just died, I think. And so we were um, we we did this record, so we were very very good friends, and uh, you know, a nice to sub for sub for him on Saturday Night Live, and and when I first started coming hanging out, to bring full circle in, in the discussion, and I was when I was slides shadow following him around to all the jazz clubs, Woody Shaw was like in his heyday, so right. we used to go see Woody play a lot, and Steve was playing with Woody then. Right. So that was after there was there was a great quintet that I'd like to mention that Woody had that I heard when I was a kid. And that was um, with Victor Lewis, Clint Houston, uh, Carter Jefferson and our friend Onaje Allen Gums. And the first record I ever made, I found out it was a Teramasahino record, but I found out I was going to be recording with Onaje and Victor. And I was through the roof because I thought, oh, man, I was 13 when I heard this record. Now I'm playing with two fifths of Woody's band. And I really love that band, but I also love the band that came after it that Steve was in, which is a very different band. First of all, trumpet and trombone is not a real usual front line in a quintet. You don't see it that often. I mean, there was the Clark Terry, Bob Brookmeyer band, but aside from that, um, but, uh, and, and I think the band with Steve and Woody was Mogru Miller, Tony Reedus and Stafford James. Does that sound right? Yeah, that was that was it. And that band was something else. And I, I, I think I remember reading interviews with Woody at the time, basically saying, you know, Steve is a real voice on the instrument. He's really coming along. Watch out for him. Things like that. Oh so, yeah, I, I felt that way when I when when I used to go to the band because at that time, because of my hookup with Slide, I used to get in the Vanguard free all the time, and um, and Steve used to knock me out. I said, "This he's going to be like the next cat on the trombone because he, you know, he had the he had the voice, he had the facility, and he had the uh, platform playing with yes. Woody. I mean, Woody was like one of the top gigs in jazz at that point. Right. And so it was, and we became really good friends. And of course, we met through the uh, world of trombones through Slide and right, and and the Buddhism, you know, and 
the Saturday Night Live, and then we did the, the band together. So we, we we and we're still very good friends. I talked with them last week. We're we're still very good friends. Beautiful. I mean, I look forward to hearing both of you separately and together in the future. And we might have to wind down in a minute. Um, I just want to say, Robin, the first time I ever got to play with you, we haven't played together much. You remember there are a couple of times I called you and, hey, man, can you do this big band gig at Rockefeller Center? Yeah, man, I'd like to, but I'm out of town. I'm in, you know, I'm in Europe. I'm in New Jersey. I'm somewhere. But the one time I know we played together was when you subbed for Dave Bargeron in the Gil Evans band at Sweet Basil. Oh, wow. Okay. And the trombone was always right behind my head. So usually it was Barge. He, you know, we all loved the gig. We wanted to be there. One time I turned around and it was Conrad, and another time I turned around and it was you. Oh wow! Yeah, I remember. I remember that that gig. They used to play at play at the Sweet Basil's a lot. Well, it was every Monday for years. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When when Gil was alive, and then after he passed, and and then there, you know, there was that time period when they were alive, where you could either go to the Vanguard and hear Mel Lewis, or you could go one block south and hear Gil Evans and. <laughs> you know, two of the greatest big bands that ever existed. Um, but they but they, they both continued after the fact. Vanguard band, of course, is still going. And the Gill band, um, we were playing it in the 90s. And I think Gill passed in 1988 or something like that. Miles leading the band then? Miles Evans, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I used to sub on them. I remember, they used to, I used to, I remember taking a solo on this Little Wing. This yep. is Jimi Hendrix song. Jimi Hendrix's Little Wing. <laughs> That's right. I remember that, that. that band is deep. I mean, the first time I ever played in that band, I got there way too early to Sweet Basil. I was so excited and trying to do right. And, you know, I had four horns and I was, Miles goes, you got to bring the alto, the soprano, the flute, and the sopranino. I'm like, you want the sopranino saxophone on Gil Evans' music? The first time I ever played with him, he's like, bro, you got to totally bring the Sopranino. You know, it's not as good as my Dave Holland, but it's, you know what, it's kind of mild. Oh, yeah, it? it's, it's, it's in there, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like that. And and the, the thing that I learned in the Gil Evans band was I sat down, we played Gil's handwriting of Little Wing, Jimi Hendrix's Little Wing. And what I learned immediately was this band plays Little Wing together and they don't play it the way it is on the charts. The band developed its own way to play that was not what was written. And if you weren't there for months and years, you didn't know that. Right. So coming in, you'd read the ink and you'd be wrong, you know. So that was that was the whole thing. Well, Robin, uh, just two more things, I guess, before we we fold up the tent. Um, I want to thank you so much for for joining me and being on uh, on Live Jazz KC tonight, man. Thank you for for being here. Really oh, appreciate thank it. You. Thanks, thanks for doing this. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, it's a, I mean, I saw the lineup and it's a, it's a lot of preparation that you have to go through every week to uh, get ready for all of these interviews. So that's, that's, it's a lot of work and dedication on your part. So I hope people- well, well, thanks, but I feel like, you know, I realized in the old days, I would have had to find a room and a cameraman and you and me during a pandemic. Right now, I'm assuming you're in New Jersey. I'm yeah. in Minnesota. Uh, so these days it's such an unbelievable thing to be able to not only have an interview with someone like you or Mark Egan or Bobby Watson, like we just did, but almost more importantly to have it archived on the internet where it's a history record of each of these person's life and journey and career and philosophies. And I think that's really valuable. I think we're building a library of great musicians getting to talk at more than just arm's length about about all the things that they've done and, and that they're thinking about. No, it is, it is. And this is, you know, it's, you know, probably look at this years from now and say, how come I have my, and have my the lamp coming on the side of my face, half of my face yes. is dark. Yes, after, after we learned how to use technology, we would never do that with a lamp, <laughs> you know? Um, well, yeah. I guess the question I wanted to, to put to you is, uh, you know, so many people, are not appreciated enough as composers. And to me, even McCoy Tyner is not appreciated enough as a writer. So I've done entire, you know, McCoy tributes where we just play his tunes. And I guess I wanted to ask you, as someone that I deem to be a great composer, what are your thoughts about composing and doing things that are fresh or original and not writing the same old shit that other people have written before? Um... Well, first, I'd like to uh, second you on McCoy stuff. When I used to, we got a chance to play in this band. It was. We should uh, clarify the, the big band, right? 
Yeah, yeah, the big band. Unbelievable to hear Parasina and Blues on the Corner played by, you know, 12 or 15 people. It was, it was just amazing. And actually, the, the music that got me out of playing rock and funk and was McCoy's band. Really? Because I was listening, <clears throat> I was into all the fusion and the Mahavishnu Orchestra and all the 11, 12 music, whatever the hell it was. And, yeah, yeah. and, um, and I went to see in that same club, well, this club called the Bijou Cafe <clears throat> in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and um, McCoy's band was playing and I, I felt the exact same energy from the, that I would get from the, all the electronic fusion bands from his acoustic band. Uh -huh. he, had, he had Joe Ford and- um, Billy Harper. Well, Billy Harper wasn't on the, when I was when I when I heard them. The Junie Booth was playing. And I think uh -huh. I think it might have. I don't even think it was Eric Gravatt. Um, Wilby Fletcher. Oh yeah, I remember Wilby Fletcher and, and, and maybe. So this is earlier. This is yeah. The, Ron the, Ron Bridgewater was playing and Joe Ford. It was oh man. Okay. Yeah, Mary Franco was playing percussion. It was, so this it, was before the band with Eddie Henderson and Earl Gardner and Virgil Jones and Billy Harper. No, no, yeah, no, no, this this was the small group. Oh, small group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. This is oh, like the, Oh, I'm sorry. So this was hearing McCoy. This is not the big Yeah, band. yeah. And that's when, when I and that's when I heard that music and I got the same kind of energy from um from hearing McCoy's music. That's when I said it doesn't have to be electric and loud and, and to right. get the same energy. So that's when I started getting into acoustic jazz and hearing uh -huh. um, uh, Chameleon and then I'm investigating what Herbie did before Chameleon right. and uh, discovered all that stuff. But for me, composition is, is for, for, it allows me to create a musical environment that I want to play in. That's that's, so there, that's that's kind of an old uh, maxim about composing music that suits you as a player and as an improviser. Right. Because you know, that, that, otherwise, that's that, that the play. It, it was kind of an offshoot of, of the things that was happening when we decided to do M bass. So we didn't have to play the standards all the time, or right. or. You know, so what do you what so what are you gonna play? And it was there wasn't any trombone so like I said in the big bands there weren't any trombone solos written for you, so you had to write your own charts. Right. So I would just write stuff that I wanted to play on. So if I wanted to work on some odd meter stuff, I would write stuff, you know, and, and maybe not like with Dave Holland's songs. I would each each solo was sort of have its own kind of section, so you wouldn't be like played ahead, and then. Right cycle through the same changes five times. Well, what you're saying right there, you know, I mean, I really hate most books about jazz, but I thought Gunther Schuller was a smart guy writing about it, probably because he played French horn on some of the Gil Evans and Miles sessions. He was a real player and a, and a great composer. But Gunther said something like, he was referring to Bird and Dizzy, and he said, you know, basic small group jazz hasn't changed since the late 40s, and he meant head, solo, head. Right. And just for me personally, when I'm writing music, I really do try to find ways to navigate around that and to create pieces that are a little more like suites, even if they're for a quartet or a quintet, to try to, what you just said is very interesting about writing different solo sections, even within a quintet, the way that you might in a big band arrangement. Right. So just each thing, so it went somewhere else. And, it, and then, you know, and I would pick the, the section that I wanted to play on. I said, this is my solo. I said, Chris Potter, you solo here. <laughs> and Nelson, you solo over there. Yeah, you play that. So, so I would pick the part that I wanted to play on for my solo and then I give the other cats the other sections or something like this. So, so for me, it was always about creating a musical environment that I, that basically that I could do what I felt I did best. Because I don't, I don't necessarily feel playing standards, even though I do it all the time, is my forte. Well, so basically, you're, you're writing music that that is personal, where you can be featured in ways that you would like to be. Yeah. So it's kind of like it almost it's almost like commissioning a cat to write a piece for you, but that cat is yourself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good place to leave it, Robin. You know, we can do this again sometime and there's really more to get on. But 
Uh, let me thank our producer, Herschel McWilliams at Live Jazz KC. I want to thank my friend and guest here, Robin Eubanks, great trombonist, great musician, great philosopher about music. And uh, very quickly, a couple uh, interviews coming up. Uh, July 12th, Cameron Brown, the great bassist. Uh, July 19th is going to be Chuck Israels. Um, and I know that down the line, we have Essiet Okan Essiet, George Colligan, um, Scott Wenholt, Greg Gisbert, um, Curtis Folks. Um, and I'm just trying to remember what the next most recent one is, maybe after the 19th. I think Greg Gisbert is July 26th and Essiet is uh, July 28th. And we just want to encourage people to donate even after the fact. And if you enjoyed this interview and you want to play it for your friends or colleagues, remember that it's archived at livejazzkc.com and also on their Facebook page. Just click events when you go to the website and you can see all of these interviews that we've done. And, uh, and that's what's happening. We call these interviews Convo Impravo because that's what we did. No, it's really killing. I mean, and just the list of names that you, that I know most of those people for sure. And it's just, you know, it covers a wide, wide range of music. That's what, and, and it's, 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 it's great to document this stuff. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, to, to, to document a variety of music and players and genders and everybody, you know, to really, to really get a lot of things out there. Robin, thank you for, for staying with us for so long. I want to thank uh, our long-suffering producer hanging in there. This is one of the longer interviews along with Sheila Jordan. Uh, yeah. but, uh, and, I, and the funny thing is when I asked you to do this, you said, well, what are we going to talk about for an hour and a half? I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> like, we, we, there's plenty to talk about. That's true. And, yeah. and one last thing. So your, your website says you have nine CDs under your own name. That might be a larger number today. Is that right? Or is it still nine? Uh, it's 10 or 11 or something. I haven't, haven't done a lot of recording lately because the music business has changed so much. Sure. Well, re and briefly, for a new Robin Eubanks fan out there who might be listening tonight, what would be two of your CDs that you would recommend that you would like a new listener to hear? Um, hmm, good question. I guess the last one, which is the big band, because that, that kind of covers a lot of ground. Because it's and, and I think actually we played the title track on the one more than meets the, is that yeah. what the record? Called? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to play one more on when we go on the way out. We're going to play one called "Mental Images" from the same record. And and what else would you would you like people to hear? Um, your music? Maybe the album that album "Mental Images" maybe is, is, is oh "Mental Images" is from another another CD. Yeah, it's a CD called "Mental Images." Well, well, let's let's hear that title track. And is there one more that you particularly uh, feel strongly about? You'd like folks to hear a little more? Uh, I don't know. Not really. Well, I would say all of it. I, I can tell you guys with impunity, I've never heard a bad Robin Eubanks record or a bad Robin Eubanks solo. The quality is always high and the creativity is always off the chain. I, oh, I you're, really you're very so. nice. I heard a bad Robin Eubanks solo tonight. The, the, Dave, <laughs> the Dave Hollins thing. I was like, woo. I'm hearing all the stuff that that went wrong during the solo. But we're, we're, we're all like that, you know, and, and Robin, what can I say? I, I can't wait to hear you and see you again when this pandemic, pandemic stuff is all over. And I want to thank you for your generosity of spirit to be here tonight and to share everything that you've shared. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for asking me to be on. And, and, and really, thanks for doing this whole series. I'm going to go check out some of the other interviews. That's, that's nice of you. And I just want you to know you're the first trombonist, but Curtis is already lined up, so you won't be the last. <laughs> Tell him I said hello. You know, you know that I will. And so, man, I want to thank you very much. And we're going to leave everybody. This is um, the title track to Robin's CD, Mental Images. And we'll hear a little snatch of this. And uh, thanks for watching Convo and Bravo. And thanks for checking out Live Jazz KC. And much love, Robin Eubanks. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. You too. Nam yo ho renge kyo. Nam yo renge kyo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.